This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. The solutions are already here. Strategies for Ecological Revolution from Below by Peter Gelderlos. Some repetitions are cliché, others are priority. I dedicate this book to those we owe a future, to Rowan, to Bruno, to Ara, to Lucia. Preface. This book is about solutions to the crisis that is destroying our planet and so many of its inhabitants. It is not another warning that will make us feel more depressed about the problem. Neither is it a quick fix designed to make us feel better for now, as the problem only festers. It is about staring the problem in the face and being honest with ourselves about the changes we have to make to truly solve it. Because the exploitation of the planet is interrelated with exploitation in human societies, the ecological crisis is very much a question of justice, reparations, or revolution. Consistent with the critiques I present here about climate apartheid and green colonialism, all of the author proceeds from sales of this book will go to indigenous initiatives against ecocide and for the recovery of their territories in Indonesia and Brazil to communities who supported this book by giving interviews and arranging for its translation into other languages. Acknowledgements. I want to send thanks to my editor, Nader Tehrani, for the scrutiny and the ideas on the outline that really helped me understand the book I was writing. I am extremely grateful to all the people who sat down for interviews, giving this book a global scope and amplifying the voices that are often excluded. Above all, I am grateful to the people who put their blood, sweat, and tears into the initiatives and battles covered in the interviews. They are the true creators of the knowledge this book attempts to focus and transmit. I want to give a special thanks to Zaniti for the enthusiasm, the help finding amazing sources, and the translations from Portuguese. Thanks to the comrades in Indonesia who made the world smaller, more connected with their solidarity and dedication. Thanks to Baki for the encouragement and the conversations about one of the more controversial aspects of this book. Thanks to Adriana for our vagabond dialogue, exploring rootedness and interrogating power across three continents. Thanks to Xander for the good conversations, the support, and all the PDFs and research recommendations that provided invaluable for this book. Thanks to Return Fire for the encouragement and sources. Thanks to T. Chow for sources and insight on engaged Buddhism. Thanks to Gabriel Kuhn for generously sharing his book with me. Thanks to Tawinike for pointers on the indigenous struggles that provided the necessary context to what is happening today in so-called Canada. Thanks to LP for helping me with therapy when I couldn't afford it. And thanks to X and Kevin for financial support. Thanks to M for handing me down that clunker of a laptop from 2006 and to Vira for helping me spring for a new used one. Thanks to my mom for nurturing in me a love of the natural world and always encouraging me to write and to my dad for those early walks in the woods to check out what the beavers were up to and for teaching me how to garden. Love and fire to all my comrades who have fought alongside me against this insatiable machine, leading the charge or watching my back. You give me life. To the generations who struggled before us, we carry you with us and to the land and water that give me sustenance as I write these lines. Thanks to Golly for the love and cuddles during a winter of pandemic and confinement, and for jumping up in my lap to distract me from writing just the right amount, 
neither too often nor too seldom. Finally, a sweet thank you to R for making it so hard to finish. Chapter 1. A Wide-Angle View The Bare Bones, The Situation Now and Our Likely Futures Our planet is suffering a crisis that is both catastrophic and unprecedented. The catastrophe is present all around us. We can measure it and we can experience it. Even if we begin with a limited focus on global warming, the aspect of the crisis that has received the most attention, we can find plenty of strands that draw our attention to a whole host of other problems that implicate not only how we produce our energy, but also how we feed ourselves, how we are governed, and how we create and share wealth. Following these strands, even in the condensed summary I am about to provide, means dealing with plenty of ugly, depressing facts. Nonetheless, taking in the scope of the problem is necessary for looking at the solutions, and ultimately, that is what this book is about. As atmospheric carbon dioxide has increased from 250 to 418 parts per million since the 19th century, the average surface temperature has gone up by almost one degree centigrade, and it is still rising. In a complex system, such a huge change does not mean a smooth, gradual warming, but a major outbreak in turbulence as shock waves ripple all throughout the interconnected systems of the planet. These shock waves include more violent storms, heavier rainfall, more deadly flooding and catastrophic landslides, and on the other hand, more intense droughts and widespread wildfires. The west coast of North America, after experiencing its most intense drought in 1,200 years, went up in flames in the summer of 2020, with fire intensity in California and Oregon many times higher than in any year of the preceding two decades. Even the Amazon rainforest is burning. Increasing temperatures and drought contribute to widespread desertification when water supplies are disrupted through mining or commercial irrigation and soil is destroyed by deforestation, overgrazing, or commercial monocrop farming, deserts expand. The Gobi Desert is swallowing up over 3,000 kilometers squared of land every year, and the half million square kilometers of arable land have disappeared in the Sahel in the last 50 years. About 40% of the continental U.S. is experiencing desertification, while in Mexico, Paraguay, and Argentina, more than half the territory is threatened. Still other shocks come in the form of deadly heat waves. In temperate and even Arctic regions, temperatures have exceeded 40 degrees centigrade for extended periods of time, while new records have been set in Death Valley 54.4 degrees centigrade in 2020, and the Sahara, 51.3 degrees centigrade in 2018. Heat waves have increased in frequency by 80% due to anthropogenic climate change. The oceans are acidifying and losing oxygen, threatening nearly all marine species with decline or extinction. Growing swaths of the Arctic are becoming ice-free every summer, leading to a loss of habitat and also creating a feedback loop. With less of the planet's surface covered in highly reflective ice, more solar radiation is absorbed, causing even more warming. The interlinked problems of severe warming, pollution, noxious infrastructures, and extractive industries are causing mass die-offs. One million species are at risk of extinction, and po animal populations across the board have declined by 68% since 1970. Extinctions are currently happening 1,000 times faster than the normal or background rate. 
Given that a habitat is a web of mutually beneficial relationships between living species and a host of geological entities, such as bodies of water, soil, and air, it is no surprise that entire habitats are disappearing. On a geological timeline, habitats are always changing. Throughout the history of our planet, habitat loss from the perspective of one species is usually habitat gain from the perspective of another species. And though we are right to associate water with life, even the spread of deserts has often been a shift from one kind of biodiversity to another kind. However, at an accelerating pace over the last century, we have witnessed a wholly different kind of change that can be described as an objective loss of habitat for all living beings, the proliferation of wastelands or dead zones. These are places that in quantitative terms have low biodiversity and low biomass. In other words, hardly anything lives there as though an entire area has been removed from the living world. A prime example are oceanic dead zones, large areas of an ocean or sea that become depleted in oxygen and subsequently devoid of most forms of life. The dead zones proliferating today are caused by chemicals from industrial agriculture saturating a watershed and causing algae blooms that consume all the oxygen. There are currently over 400 such dead zones worldwide, including in the Chesapeake Bay, off the coast of Louisiana, in the Northern Adriatic, the Kattegat Strait between the Baltic Sea and the North Sea, and in the coastal waters of China, Japan, and New Zealand. Another example of a wasteland, a former habitat that our society has made unsuitable for life, are the toxic sites poisoned by a wide variety of industrial practices. Manufacturing, especially in the chemical and electronics industries, mining and energy production result in huge quantities of toxic waste that is lethal to humans and other life forms. Much of this pollution stays in the environment a very long time, with examples including the radioactive byproducts of nuclear energy, with a half-life of billions of years, or synthetic chemicals like PFOA, a carcinogen used in Teflon that is so stable it is all but destructible. These toxins are concentrated at the point of production or intentionally stored in a waste dump. With a cavalier mentality, such sacrifice zones are justified as the necessary price for people to have air fresheners, or new cell phones. Though in truth, no sacrifice zone is perfectly isolated, with carcinogens and other poisons leaking off into the water, soil, or air for the foreseeable future. In other instances, however, poisonous chemicals are intentionally pumped into the environment as widely as possible, as is the case of the 2.5 million tons of pesticides used for industrial agriculture every year. In the United States, highly contaminated industrial wastelands are placed within the Superfund system, which lists 40,000 toxic sites spread across the country. 50% of the population of New Jersey live within three miles of a Superfund site. Cleanup is paid for by consumers and taxpayers. However, most sites are left to slowly leak out with no cleanup whatsoever. The meaning and impact of a toxic site are impossible to convey quantitatively. In order to understand just what is being done to the planet, perhaps we need to get a little more visual. The most devastated places I have ever seen were an open pit copper mine in the Atacama Desert and Sierra Minera in Cartagena, Spain. The Atacama Desert is the driest place on earth. Walking across the face of it feels like being on the surface of another planet. Nonetheless, there are quite a few creatures that live in that seemingly inhospitable place. And the longer you spend there, the more you pay attention, the more you realize how alive it really is, 
even before you discover the lomas or fog oases that survive by drawing moisture out of the air and the forests of Chañar, trees kept alive by groundwater. The open pit copper mines, operated by multinationals or by the state-owned company called Delco, are nothing like that. The one I saw was like a gaping wound in the earth, too big and brutal to be believed. It was unsettling the way the mine, clearly excavated without any concern for the harm it entailed, was nonetheless dug out in a semblance of geometric perfection, a terraced abyss of concentric rings, like some deeply unhappy creature's idea of beauty. The devastation of the habitat, the scars of heavy machinery, countless tons of explosives and toxic runoff had resulted in a landscape hostile to life itself, and the death it caused went well beyond the gigantic hole in the ground, nearly a kilometer deep and several kilometers across. All the water stolen by the industry has irrevocably depleted the water table that fragile desert ecosystems depend on. Many once lush forests in desert oases are now graveyards of desiccated trees. The Sierra Minera of Cartagena has been mined for 2,500 years since the times of the Phoenicians and Carthaginians. In the mid 20th century, multinational mining companies switched to the more profitable open pit mining system. Now it looks like Mordor, which incidentally was based on the artillery blasted trenches Tolkien witnessed in World War I, as well as the slag heaps and smoke choked landscape of the coal mining and industrial regions of the English Midlands. A comparison that suggests an affinity between total warfare and industrial mining. Denuded hills carved out in unnatural shapes, a long interplay of excavations, the roads flattened to carry the minerals away, and then erosion as mud and rock gave way to wind and rain, and then baked dry in the sun, and everywhere pools of blood-red goo giving off noxious smells. Countless children in nearby villages are experiencing severe health problems from leftover toxins years after the mines have been closed. Next to the toxic sites produced by mining and industry, one of the most common types of wasteland presents quite the contrast. Though they are defining features of landscapes in the global north, few people would think to include them as examples of a wasteland. In fact, they actually masquerade as symbols of fertility, prosperity, and lush green bounty in the bourgeois imaginary. I'm talking about the two bookends of capitalist suburbia, green lawns and parking lots. There are over 160,000 square kilometers of lawn in the U.S. alone maintained to the tune of billions of dollars of chemical products, water, and gasoline-powered lawn mowers, making it the number one crop in the entire country. This huge expanse, twice as large as all of Ireland, is home to a tiny number of grass species, which are cut short before they can feed any pollinators, and serves as a meager habitat for a small number of bugs. It is, in other words, far more desolate than a desert. Parking lots and asphalted areas more generally are the companion to the artificially green residential subdivisions. To fulfill their dream of consumer bliss, all those isolated houses with parceled lawns require individualized transportation, cars, and abundant places to leave those cars while shopping and working. Mortgaged home ownership, consumerism, and car culture form the normative idea of success and happiness at the center of American capitalism. 
an idea that has globalized considerably over the past decades. Between roads and parking lots, 158,000 square kilometers across the U.S. are covered in pavement. This is almost as much land as is dedicated to wheat farming. In the U.K., it's around 8,000 square kilometers. Aside from constituting a dead zone hostile to nearly all forms of life, parking lots and roads are a source of water pollution and urban heating. The destruction of Earth, the Earth's living communities has a major impact on human life as well. One study found that in 2018, one in every five deaths around the world was caused by fossil fuels. The World Health Organization estimates that between 2030 and 2050, climate change will cause an additional 250,000 deaths every year, though this only counts excess deaths deaths in ex excess of rates previously considered normal, from more severe heat waves, loss of access to clean water due to climate change, malnutrition caused by drought, and the geographical spread of the malaria zone. The already alarming figure of 2.5 million people killed every decade by the energy, agriculture, and manufacturing industries does not take into account the complex way that different aspects of the ecological crisis are interrelated beyond just climate. Take all the deaths caused by contaminated drinking water. Deforestation causes erosion, which together with the climate trend toward more violent storms, increases flooding, one of the principal ways drinking water is contaminated. And the shift from localized subsistence agriculture to commercial cash crop production, open parenthesis, the green revolution encouraged by leading governments, corporations, and institutions the world over, close parenthesis, multiplies the wasteful use of water as well as poisonous runoff. Contamination of water is also caused by mining, waste dumps, and urbanization. The result is that 500,000 small children are killed every year. While only a small portion of those deaths are directly attributable to global warming, access to clean water is undeniably an ecological issue, a question of how we treat our environment and what kind of economic activities we promote to, quote, make a living, close quote, as inappropriate as that phrase often is. What about food production? How we feed ourselves is one of the ways we most intensively interact with the rest of the living world. Every year, human societies produce a surplus of food, yet 3.1 million people die from malnutrition and undernutrition, even in wealthy countries. Millions of poor and racialized people are put at risk of diabetes and heart disease because they live in food deserts, neighborhoods where it is impossible to obtain healthy, fresh food. Air pollution caused largely by cars, energy production, and manufacturing was already killing 8.8 .8 million people a year in 2015. A study in The Lancet found 1.8 million deaths a year caused by water pollution and 1 million deaths a year caused by pollution in the workplace. Our society produces a tremendous amount of waste, which is bad news for the people, usually poor people, who have to live close to it. Living near a landfill substantially increases the risk of a range of cancers and respiratory diseases. And none of these statistics do justice to the millions of people who are sickened or disabled for life, the people who take care of them, and all the people who have to carry on after losing loved ones. Because our society is making ever larger areas of the planet unlivable, millions of people are forced to pull up their roots and migrate in search of a more secure place to live. Ecological refugees face the trauma of losing their homes, 
the racist abuse they endure throughout their migration, and if they do not join the tens of thousands who die in the Mediterranean or the Sonoran Desert, victims of border regimes that are designed to kill, extreme marginalization when they arrive in the countries that have profited the most off their ecological woes. In just the first half of 2019, seven million people were internally displaced within their home countries by extreme weather events, which is two times more than the number displaced by violent conflicts. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, has estimated that by 2050, there will be 150 million environmental migrants or climate refugees. In other words, our society's destruction of the earth is very much a suicidal activity and is already one of the greatest causes of death and suffering that humans face. No one knows what the future will look like, not even the next hundred years. The exercise of modeling likely climate scenarios is problematic because it often obscures the death and destruction that is already taking place. Bandying about different projections of temperature and sea level rise expected by 2050 to decide how urgently we must take action is to implicitly promote the idea that what is going on right now is acceptable, that the present is some gold standard we should try to preserve as closely as possible. The normalization of all this death and suffering has much to do with who is profiting off the ecological crisis. It can be useful to guide our efforts to look at the likely changes we may face, but I want to reject any notion of normalizing only 10 million human deaths a year or only a 10% extinction event as some kind of victory. In the mainstream conversation around climate change, the most optimistic proposal suggests achieving carbon neutral economies by 2050 which supposedly could keep the temperature from rising more than two degrees centigrade. What changes could we expect to see in that most optimistic scenario? The millions of yearly deaths discussed above would increase as clean water becomes scarcer, droughts and extreme weather events multiply, and desertification spreads. Somewhere around 25% of species could go extinct. To name just one of the many precious ecosystems that will suffer collapse, 99% of coral reefs will die off, leading to the loss of 25% of marine species and the livelihoods of 500 million people. It will be a world rocked by extreme deadly heat waves breaking all previous records. The land area subjected to extreme summer heat will quadruple. By 2050, the land that 150 million people live on will be reclaimed by the sea, and the land that 300 million people live on will be below the level of annual coastal floods, destroying coastal cities around the world. Further rises in sea level would probably be locked in over the following centuries. This is by no means a rosy picture. Nonetheless, governments, NGOs, and scientific institutions around the world are banking on this scenario as an acceptable level of collateral damage. It is no wonder that the breathless chorus of mainstream voices cheerleading the optimistic goal of going, quote, carbon neutral by 2050, close quote, rarely discuss the extreme suffering and devastation that actually accompany their chosen timeline. City governments around the world run web pages touting their, quote, smart city plans for public transportation, ride shares, and green energy. Think tanks and NGOs try to whip up enthusiasm for the few politicians who have actually committed to the goal and barely any of them mention what that rosy scenario means for the planet and its people. Yet it's even worse than that. There is no guarantee that going carbon neutral by 2050 will actually function as the meager containment wall it is being sold as. 
scientific predictions relating to climate have consistently underestimated the intensity and timeline of projected changes. To name just one example, a summer heat wave in Alaska in 2019 led to a massive salmon die-off. The science director for a local watershed nonprofit spoke about a climate model they had prepared just three years earlier that included moderate and pessimistic scenarios. 2019 exceeded the value we expected for the worst case scenario in 2069, she told the media. Runaway warming might be caused by a number of feedback loops that are already reaching their tipping point. When the IPCC first introduced the concept of climate tipping points two decades ago, they believed that no such tipping point would be triggered shy of five degrees centigrade of warming. Now they recognize that many tipping points can be triggered with just one or two degrees of warming and that there is in fact evidence that some have already begun. These include the collapse of the ice sheets, which would substantially decrease the portion of the Earth's surface that reflects solar radiation back into space. As the polar regions warm at an accelerated rate, Arctic permafrost is beginning to thaw. This has the potential to release a huge amount of methane, a greenhouse gas roughly 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Boreal forests in Siberia and North America are also falling victim to warming through more frequent forest fires and insect plagues. The massive tree and soil die-off means the release of more CO2. The Amazon rainforest, currently home to one in 10 species on the planet and absorbing 600 million metric tons of carbon a year, is in danger of turning into a giant savanna or even a desert. Droughts caused by warming together with deforestation for commercial agriculture work together to take their toll. The estimate is that when the Amazon loses between 20 and 40% of its forest cover, the entire ecosystem will collapse. Warming in the oceans is causing the slowdown of Atlantic currents that are vital to the transfer of heat and nutrients that form the basis of marine ecosystems, as well as much of the planet's weather. This could exacerbate droughts in Africa's Sahel region and in the Amazon, and would even disrupt the East Asian monsoon, which means the collapse of more habitats and more suffering for humans and other forms of life. The implication is that even if we stop all greenhouse gas emissions today, there may be natural processes underway that force a shift to a new dynamic equilibrium, a hothouse planet unlike anything nearly all species alive today have evolved to survive. What might that look like? A 4.5 degrees centigrade rise in temperature could mean 50% of species would go extinct, and that's only in a short-term analysis. By the end of the century, one billion people would be displaced and hundreds of millions would fall victim to famine. 55% of the world's human population would suffer more than 20 days of lethal heat a year. It's more than 100 days a year in the middle latitudes. Between scorching conditions and the collapse of insect populations, crop yields could decrease by a fifth or more. It's no wonder that even the World Bank says that a four degrees centigrade of warming might be, quote, beyond adaptation, close quote, for human civilization. The hot period could easily last 200,000 years. As we shall see, the experts cannot solve this problem, and they have already wasted valuable decades. The subtext to the official conversation belies a staggering apathy. We will not be the ones to die. All those who disappear, human and otherwise, are an acceptable loss. We will come out on top. For many people, especially among policymakers and experts, there's a truth to that mindset, at least for now. The millions of human deaths caused by the ecological crisis every year are not shared equally, 
Most of them occur in the global south. However, while the semantic distinction between global north and global south is useful, many of the same processes occur in both places. The world is not as divided as those on top want to believe. For example, though the 60,000 people killed on average every year by extreme weather events mostly live in the global south, so-called wealthy countries are not immune. The 2003 heat wave in Europe, for example, led to 70,000 excess deaths. Needless to say, few of them were living in the houses of the wealthy with their high ceilings and air conditioning. And while 92% of pollution-related deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries, 800,000 people die every year from air pollution in Europe, and 155,000 die every year in the U.S. Still, even these deaths are unevenly distributed. Not many rich people live near industrial parks and toxic waste dumps. In settler states like the U.S., Canada, Australia, and Argentina, class is largely inscribed by the historical legacy of colonialism, with the descendants of enslaved Africans and indigenous peoples subjected to conditions that the global distribution of wealth and power usually reserves for the global south. When Hurricane Katrina descended on New Orleans in 2005, killing 1,800 people, anyone paying attention saw that the way infrastructure was built in poor and black neighborhoods left people vulnerable, whereas infrastructure in wealthy white neighborhoods was designed to protect people. And contrary to the spontaneous initiatives of mutual aid that constituted the primary lifesaver, with neighbors helping neighbors survive the storm and ex-Black Panthers and anarchists setting up the first on-site clinic, Government responses focused on shooting neighbors trying to take clean water or diapers from supermarkets, and then making sure that only middle class and wealthy residents could return to the city, quote, gentrification by God, close quote. As, as Neil Smith wrote in the aftermath of that storm, there is no such thing as a natural disaster. The disaster was produced and directed by economic and political structures. Those who currently hold power in our society, those who have failed us tragically, do not have our interests at heart, nor those of the planet. And in fact, our interests and the interests of the earth are one and the same. We do not know how disastrous these next decades will be, but there is one certainty that can give us hope and courage. There is not a single scenario in which taking action in defense of ourselves, in defense of one another, in defense of all the interconnected life on this planet will not make things better. In the biosphere, everything is connected, the ecological crisis beyond carbon. The default assumption in our society has been that nature is mechanical rather than communicative. For something to be communicative, it has to have subjectivity. And if it has subjectivity, it becomes harder to justify treating it like our personal toilet or gold mine. Although there have been extraordinary biologists and other experts who have seen in the living world the same mutuality and communicativity that others see, the history of the scientific method from Francis Bacon to the present has in other ways been a process of trained scientists getting dragged kicking and screaming, sometimes by their own research, away from the notion that intelligence or personhood are the exclusive properties of educated white men. Nonetheless, that original assumption still frequently pops up as the default in many intellectual circles. It feels false to state what has become undeniable, that we can benefit a great deal from observing and learning from other forms of life. The reason it feels so is that to pass from a society that treats the rest of the world so horribly to one that sees benefit in learning from others is just a continuation of extra 
extractivist models of knowledge that are part and parcel of the extractivist economy that has wreaked havoc on the Earth's living communities. Recognizing that other living beings have their own voices helps us perceive the ways everything is connected, which in turn shows that we cannot take a piecemeal approach to the ecological crisis. A few years ago, I started keeping a list of all the bird species I saw in my area. Anyone who does bird watching knows that even if you appreciated birds before, you really begin to observe them on a different level once you train your gaze to distinguish between one species and another. Few species stay still long enough in plain view with good lighting to allow for a positive identification on size and color alone, assuming you do not have an expensive pair of binoculars. Instead, you have to look at their beak, nutcracker, flesh eater, or insectivore, what kind of tree they're hanging out in, group behavior, flight patterns, and songs. Even if I had previously loved birds in the abstract, I had no specific relation with them, and so they were, for all intents and purposes, scenery. The moment I began treating them as beings with personhood and a specific place in a web of relationships, a whole world opened up and I was enriched by the complexities around me. One of the most striking things I noticed is that birds know when spring arrives. Since I began watching them, there comes a day early in the year when from one day to the next, a dozen or more species change their behavior dramatically. Where they had spent the winter extremely human shy and often hiding, now they are looking for the best places to stand in the sunshine and sing with utter abandon. Moreover, their behavior that day is different from the courtship rituals that would begin a little later in the year and included birds that already had mates. The extreme difference in behavior left a quantitative register as well. The first year I noticed it, I was able to positively identify as many species in a day as I had during the course of the preceding winter. The only way to describe it is that they were celebrating. Proponents of the default assumptions of Western thinking will make the unsurprising claim that this is anthropomorphizing, projecting human characteristics on non-humans. Such an unfortunate coincidence that we have no term for the inverse flaw, assuming that only humans possess what are actually widespread traits. In recent decades, biologists have rediscovered what others never forgot, that other living beings think, feel, learn, play, and can be sad or happy. Ritual, culture, intergenerational learning, and mourning are also being documented in a growing body of research so we may as well get ahead of the curve and speak frankly about celebration too. It gave me great joy to discover this sudden change shared across multiple species of birds by some unknown consensus. And I mean discovery, not in the sense of knowledge that I produced, but knowledge that was shared with me when I had the humility or good sense to respectfully approach another community of living beings and see what they had to teach me. That joy was a sort of non-instrumental knowledge that for me was the most important thing. Even though it is a type of knowledge our society places a low premium on, it was accompanied by instrumental forms of knowledge as well. For example, the bird's declaration of spring was not merely a subjective, culturally inscribed proclamation. Their affirmation also has about it something of the cold, hard fact. 
every year so far, after the day marking their distinct change in behavior, the temperature has gone up and the nightly frosts have ended. The fact that the birds are making a weather prediction with at least some degree of accuracy and freely sharing this knowledge with anyone who cares for it is relevant to me because I keep a garden. If I plant my tomatoes before the last frost, no more tomatoes. And this knowledge takes on a new level of significance as we follow it through time. So far, the day has tended to come earlier year after year. In 2020, it came a half month earlier than 2019. With the birds already conducting their ostensible celebration in mid-January, when we pay attention to the world around us, we can see the signs of climate change and a great deal more. I live in Catalonia. Starting in March, we experienced almost two months of strict lockdown. These conditions led to a remarkable improvement in air quality due to the mass reduction in chemical and noise pollution. After all, car traffic had come to an almost absolute halt. While traffic and air quality returned to their abysmal normal by the summer, there were several effects that lasted throughout the entire year. The change in insect populations was the most dramatic. Just counting the wave of moths that came into my apartment every night during the summer, the number of species increased by a factor of five and the total volume by a factor of two or three. And by paying attention to it in this way, the intrusion became a cause for celebration rather than for the purchase of some chemical insecticide that would invariably end up in my own drinking water. The number and variety of spiders in the fields beyond my neighborhood also increased noticeably. And while spiders are not insects, the species they depend on for food are. The catastrophic collapse of insect populations is a cornerstone of the ongoing ecological crisis. Insects occupy several vital nodes in the food web, aiding with the decomposition of plant and animal matter, helping turn dead creatures into the soil that forms the basis of most living cycles, serving as the primary pollinators for nearly all flowering plant species, and serving as a prime food source for small birds, reptiles, amphibians, and mammals, and thus indirectly as a food source for the large birds, reptiles, amphibians, and mammals that eat those. The loss of insects threatens all those other species. Without them, the webs of life that currently populate the earth become impossible to imagine. Insect populations are falling victim to a diverse array of threats, including rising temperatures, water and air pollution from cars and manufacturing, and large-scale pesticide usage. This corner of the catastrophe is a key example of why it does not make sense to compartmentalize the ecological crisis or focus reductively on climate. It is most certainly all connected. And we are connected with it. Localized knowledge of the kind I am describing, though it can be brushed off as anecdotal, is important because it accentuates our consciousness of these problems. It motivates us to care for the other beings that are affected and thus to take action. And it can also help guide that action. My observations about the effect of car traffic on insect populations are not enough to confidently claim that getting rid of cars will solve the problem but it is certainly enough to suggest that putting a stop to car traffic might well be a good start. The localized decrease in pollution was connected to a quick rebound in at least some species that was robust enough to continue even after pollution returned to normal levels.
When everyone is sensitized to the other forms of life we share this planet with, we will be more knowledgeable, more agile, and more rapid in responding to threats to the ecology, more able to heal our ecosystem. And our territorial knowledge can be complemented by scientific research, accelerating processes of empirical understanding and reducing the burden on specialized nodes of scientific production that have been too easily bought off by the very industries that are killing us, leaving conscientious scientists actually trying to fix the problem as an overextended minority. Learning that it is all connected also means learning to connect. Ornithologists and conservationists trying to restore devastated Atlantic puffin populations on the islands of coastal Maine failed year after year until they learned, quote, to think like a puffin, close quote. Atlantic puffins were decimated by commercial hunters in the late 19th century. By the late 20th century, the islands they might use as breeding colonies were either wildlife refuges protected by the government or simply isolated rocks no longer targeted by any extractive industry, hunting or otherwise. Though they were safe, puffins did not return to breed on many of the small islands where the, their populations had been extinguished, even after conservationists started hatching eggs on those islands. It was only when conservationists started thinking about how puffins are intensely social creatures that they started to change their tactics. After going out to sea for the extended hunting season, what would cause a returning adult puffin to decide not to start nesting on the island of their birth? Maybe they would be too timid to start nesting on a rocky islet on which there was no sign of other puffins. The conservationists began making puffin decoys and placing them across the islands that were now a safe breeding territory for the bird. The technique was a success and led to Atlantic puffins recolonizing a significant part of their former range. Since then, similar techniques have been used to aid 42 seabird populations in 14 countries. Sometimes reintroducing a missing species creates a trophic cascade that changes an entire ecosystem in a way that makes it more robust, more able to withstand climate change and other aspects of the ecological crisis. Sea otters have been involved in several such trophic cascades across the west coast of North America. The otters were hunted almost to extinction by commercial fur traders in the 18th and 19th centuries, disappearing from most of their range. Since then, they have made a recovery in several areas, sometimes on their own, sometimes with the help of conservationists, and the effect has been remarkable. In the Aleutian Islands of Alaska, they brought down sea urchin populations which had exploded in their absence. With fewer urchins, the kelp forests could thrive again. And in several California estuaries, they have contributed to a growth in seagrass of 600% in just three decades, in part by eating the crabs that eat the sea slugs that keep seagrass clean and healthy. This is remarkable for several reasons. Conservationists were scarcely aware that estuaries even constituted a part of sea otter's natural habitat, and the U.S. government left estuaries out of the otter recovery plan. Furthermore, seagrass beds should not have been recovering in the estuaries feeding into Monterey Bay and the San Francisco Bay because of how polluted these water systems are by chemical and nutrient runoff from California's massive for-profit agricultural industry, showing how much difference a healthy web of relationships can make in mitigating the effects of pollution. Seagrass and the salt marshes that are also starting to recover with the aid of sea otters are so important 
because they help decrease coastal erosion during storms, a problem that will only grow through the 21st century. And they constitute an important carbon sink, a habitat that takes carbon out of the atmosphere. They are also an important protective habitat and source of food for numerous other species. The same is true of the kelp forests. Quote, the difference in annual absorption of atmospheric carbon from kelp photosynthesis between a world with and a world without sea otters is somewhere between 13 and 43 billion kilograms, 13 and 43 teragrams of carbon, close quote, according to marine biologist James Estes. Moving from Monterey Bay to the driest place on earth, we find another example of interconnectivity. The Lomas are fog oases in the Atacama of northern Chile and the coastal deserts of Peru, a region where rainfall is almost completely absent, measured in mere millimeters a year. Despite the lack of precipitation, Diverse ecosystems have been able to thrive thanks to the mist that frequently appears. Taller trees in the Lomas have especially evolved to condense liquid water from the fog, capture it, and guide it down to the roots, sharing it with all the other plant species that make a life there. Despite the desert conditions, there are 1,400 plant species throughout the different Lomas forests, nearly half of them found nowhere else. Most of the Lomas, however, have been damaged or destroyed as a result of Spanish colonization and the exploitative economic practices that it unleashed, such as commercial grazing, logging, and mining. While they once covered 15,000 square kilometers, they have now shrunk by 90% of their former range. The city of Copiapó, called St. Francis of the Forest by the Spanish, now sits in a desolate valley mostly devoid of trees, and even its river has dried up. Yet humans were a healthy part of Lomas ecosystems. Before colonization, the Chiribaya culture irrigated 85 hectares of farmland and had grazing land for alpacas and llamas at a town near Ilo, fed entirely by four springs coming from the Lomas. Now the area is mostly denuded. Conservation efforts in the Lomas initially did not take into account the role indigenous peoples have played in their ecosystems. Ecologists rediscovered what the land's indigenous inhabitants had already known that certain taller trees, like Cesalpinia spinosa, the Tara tree, played a keystone role in the Lomas ecosystem by capturing water from the fog. Yet when they tried and failed to reseed a new generation of Tara trees, their investigation into why reseeding efforts were unsuccessful finally revealed what should have been the most obvious oversight. Genetic analysis suggested that indigenous peoples intentionally seeded and cultivated tara trees, aided by their llamas and alpacas, who ate the fruits and digested the coating of the seeds, making them more likely to germinate. The cattle, sheep, and goats favored by commercial-slash-colonial agriculture, incidentally, will not touch the tara fruit. A similar theme begins to emerge when we look back at the catastrophic pattern of wildfires in Western North America. About three years ago, it began to be widely reported in mainstream media that Western fire suppression techniques were largely responsible for forests becoming saturated with explosive amounts of brush that lead to cataclysmic wildfires and that the traditional techniques of indigenous peoples from the region, like the Karuk, Yuruk, and Mono, were actually far superior. They constituted a folk technology designed to prevent cataclysmic wildfires 
as well as to ensure a healthy forest with high biodiversity and plenty of species humans could subsist off of. With a satisfied tone that suggested some historical wrong had been corrected, many of these articles mentioned that government forestry and parks bureaucracies would begin to consult with the indigenous former custodians of the land. Or they simply mentioned that scientists had begun to study indigenous techniques, an ambiguity that is ominous to anyone aware of what it has historically meant for scientists to study non-Western peoples. None of the mainstream articles I could find mentioned the especial cruelty with which white people occupied the Western part of the continent, from the Spanish and Mexican concentration camps to the massacres of the California gold rush. None of them offer much detail on how native controlled burnings were part of a web of interrelated practices, both economic and spiritual, that linked field agriculture with forest gardens with hunting protecting an ecosystem that offered humans a healthy and varied diet and ensured a place for diversity of other species and that gave people meaning as a part of that ecosystem in which the other living beings were their relatives. Few of them even mention how indigenous forestry techniques were suppressed together with their language, their religion, their practice of commoning rather than private property, all while they were being violently forced off their land. And none of them discuss where those indigenous nations are today, what sorts of economic conditions and social discriminations they face, and how they are fighting for justice or redress. At most, they describe government-tribe partnerships, apparently devoid of conflict or inequality. Even alternative progressive media tended to be weak on these details. After the major catastrophic wildfires in Australia in 2019 and 2020, similar articles began to appear with regard to Aboriginal fire and forestry techniques replicating all the same patterns. A typical mainstream news article is full of quotes from settler academics but does not quote nor mention by name a single Aboriginal person, community, or people. As Matis and Cree writer Mike Goldhawk remarked, quote, acknowledgement isn't the opposite of erasure, doesn't stop erasure, and can facilitate further erasure and things worse than erasure. Colonizers have been playing the two off each other since the beginning of colonialism, close quote. What becomes undeniable the more we look is that all across the world, humans are a fundamental part of the ecosystems we live in, from the Arctic tundra to the temperate forests to the Amazon and the Atacama. But it is also hard to deny that there are very different manners of being human with a huge gulf between them. There are the humans who constitute a keystone species, consciously holding their local ecosystem together with intelligent, traditional, decentralized and adaptable technologies. And there are the humans who constitute the number one threat to life on this planet. The idea that humans are the bad guys in the ecological crisis is too simplistic. It lets us off the hook for the soul searching we need to do to fix the problem. Because if we are the bad guys, there is something inevitable about what is going on. And the best we can hope for is to choose the lesser of evils. This plays directly into conventional conservationism preserving some small parcel of nature, roped off from our evil influence, of course, to mitigate the devastation and also to visit occasionally, paying an entrance fee perhaps, and to reflect on some mythical paradise lost. 
when we begin to look at connections between the destruction of nature and the destruction of other humans, the narrative becomes more complex. The looming extinction of the orcas of the Southern Salish Sea has garnered a good deal of media attention, focused especially on one Puget Sound pod. No whale in that pod had given birth in three years until one female got pregnant in 2018. However, her baby died soon after birth and she carried the body around in mourning for 17 days over more than 1,000 miles. The orcas have all but stopped breeding for a variety of reasons that are not fully understood, but all of which have to do not with humans per se, as the Puget Sound orcas have happily been neighbors to humans for thousands of years, but with this second type of human whose outline is starting to emerge. Principal causes likely include noise from the many large ships that ply the waterway, as well as declining Chinook salmon populations, victim to the hydroelectric dams that clog up most of the rivers in the watershed. Industrial pollution is another factor. In the five years up to 2018, Boeing dumped thousands of times over the legal limit of extremely toxic PCBs into the Duwamish River, part of the Puget Sound watershed. A leader in the aerospace industry, Boeing is a major armaments producer. Is there a relation between Boeing's habit of releasing poisonous chemicals into the environment with no regard for the harm they will cause and their willingness to profit off machines designed to kill, destroy, and maim, primarily for the benefit of the country most likely to use weapons against civilian populations in other parts of the world? To suggest otherwise seems willfully naive. A different war measure subsidized by the U.S. government in the 19th century presents an unlikely precedent to Boeing's amoral profiteering a war measure that completely transformed the Great Plains of North America. Throughout the century, the settler government pursued a series of wars against hundreds of indigenous nations as part of its design to capture an entire swath of the continent, quote, from sea to shining sea. The idea of Manifest destiny synthesized Puritan notions of white supremacy with the equally supremacist and teleological scientific ideas of the day from the clockmaker god of enlightenment founding fathers to the social Darwinism of the late 19th century. Indigenous nations that successfully fought back against the U.S. War of Conquest belied the supposed destiny of continental domination and threw a wrench in the gears of Euro-American progress. In particular, the alliance of Lakota, Cheyenne, and other Great Plains nations, the victors of Red Cloud's War of 1868 and the vanquishers of Custer's 7th Cavalry, blocked a major conduit in the colonization of the West and thwarted Yankee pretensions of superiority. U.S. war planners came to realize that the indigenous knowledge of the territory and their ecological niche as nomadic hunters sustained by the vast herds of millions of bison gave them advantages in guerrilla warfare that would be hard to overcome. So they began a program of offering bounties for the killing of bison depriving their enemies of their primary food source and imposing dependence on the reservation system, a euphemism for the concentration camps that served to subject imprisoned nations to police control, suppress indigenous languages and spiritual systems, and impose a Western socioeconomic order based on individualized private property, field agriculture, and the consumption of addictive commodities. General Sherman, who had applied total war techniques in the Civil War 
destroying the South's food supply, organized military expeditions, and supplied private hunters to eradicate the native food supply. Lieutenant General John Schofield was transparent in his memoirs. Quote, with my cavalry and carbined artillery, I wanted no other occupation in life than to ward off the savages and kill off his food until there should be no longer an Indian frontier in our beautiful country, close quote. As bison herds dwindled from 100 million to just a few hundred in under a century, an added benefit accrued to the settler state. With the enclosure of lands, the suppression of indigenous resistance, and the near extinction of the bison, coupled with murderous union-busting tactics also being deployed in those years, there were no more impediments to the construction of the transcontinental railroads vital to the occupation and industrialization of the West Coast, a prerequisite on multiple levels for the likes of Boeing to pollute watersheds and build war machines a century later. The replacement of bison with for market field agriculture and cattle herds belonging to individual owners who sent their livestock by railroad to the industrial slaughterhouses of Chicago and thence to feed the blooming populations of the East Coast metropolises directly contributed to one of the greatest ecological disasters of the early 20th century, the Dust Bowl. During the years of the Dust Bowl, over 400,000 square kilometers of soil dried up and blew away, incidentally allowing the banks to appropriate a huge swath of territory by foreclosing on small farmers. What we have here then is a strategic war measure ideated, organized, and subsidized by the state deployed by settler paramilitary entrepreneurs in that pattern of diffuse police action particular to settler democracies that fed into capitalist projects of industrial development and primitive accumulation, which in turn simultaneously operated as both cause and consequence of ecocide. In other words, a broad expanse of thriving ecosystems was intentionally destroyed as a counterinsurgency strategy of catching the fish by draining the pond. The continued destruction of those ecosystems was accelerated by the capitalist economic processes that the counterinsurgency measures deployed by a colonial regime had made possible. In broad terms, this constant counterinsurgency is being waged not against an inert nature, but against a dynamic practice, commoning. Commoning is the practice of holding the land in common, but it also goes much deeper than that. It can be viewed as an ecological rather than an economic practice, as the goal is not to alienate wealth, to produce commodities for a market, and thus to accumulate capital that can be reinvested in more ecologically destructive slash economically productive activities. On the contrary, the goal is to procure the health and well-being of the members of the community in a way that preserves their autonomy through an interdependence with their local ecosystem rather than a forced dependence on an accumulative economy. This means that a commoning constitutes a roadblock to capitalism and also a zone of illegibility and resistance to state authority. Due to their ecological interdependence, commoning societies tend toward ecocentric worldviews and practices, though this does not mean they are immune to the world-hating philosophies present in Christianity and industrial scientific progressivism that often serve as the handmaidens to colonialism. The war on the commons has in fact been one of the main philosophical and economic endeavors of liberalism, 
from the 18th century to today. One aspect of this war has been the now discredited myth of the, quote, tragedy of the commons, close quote, an idea put out by major landowners with no direct experience of commoning, who wanted very much to warn their fellow man that preventing landowners from privatizing common resources leads to scarcity and chaos. Of course, it leads to a scarcity of investment opportunities for those who would own all of society. And by chaos, the ruling class has always meant the self-organization of the lower classes. The commons have been suppressed not by reason, but by centuries-long military and police campaigns that continue to this day. The British government, both at home and in their colonies, frequently employed the death penalty against peasants making use of communal resources according to traditional norms. And a large part of the substance of colonization was the destruction of indigenous practices of commoning in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. In the Spanish state, Areas with long traditions of defending the commons were at the forefront of the anarchist collectivizations during the Civil War in 1936. One of the responses of the Franco regime was to accelerate the depopulation of the countryside, in part by flooding several mountain valleys for the construction of major hydroelectric dams. Writers like James C. Scott have already remarked on the tendency of dictators to favor huge infrastructural projects, especially when these destroy ecosystems that had long served as protective habitats for resistance movements, like the Pontine marshes near Rome or the Mesopotamian marshes in Iraq. The depopulation of the Pyrenees had already begun in earnest in the 19th century through deforestation to provide fuel for the ironworks necessary to industrialism and the building of the railroads. The railroads were a convenient vehicle for directly seizing and enclosing communal lands, as well as being necessary for the economic acceleration of industrialization. Deforestation, meanwhile, led to erosion and ecosystem collapse, which directly weakened the position of rural commoners. Commoning tends to encourage and rely on a diverse ecosystem, contrary to the monocrop deserts of commodity agriculture. With erosion and deforestation in the mountains, pastoralists and the trementaire white women who traveled between mountain communities collecting herbs and practicing popular health care were among the most affected. Together, they constituted some of the most ardent defenders of the commons, as well as an autonomous system of knowledge, movement, and sustenance. With the loss of grazing land and plant bio diversity, they had little choice but to look for jobs in the mines, the industrial colonies, and the cities. Though their rebellious spirit would continue to break out in those artificial environments over the next decades. Over a long timeline, we see a familiar pattern, an ecological collapse that is the deliberate result of a state strategy for counterinsurgency as well as a consequence of the economic expansion that accompanies the expansion of state power. The state appears as the prime strategic agent of these changes, yet very different types of state promote the conditions of capitalist accumulation that the owning class require. In order to understand this dynamic, we can turn to a concept that emerged from the revolutionary struggles of the 19th century and that has subsequently been utilized in the framework of insurrectionary anarchism, social war. André Léo developed the concept of social war 
not as a war of everyone against everyone or against nature, but of the state and the bourgeoisie against society. Leo was an anti-authoritarian feminist, survivor of the Paris Commune and victim of Marxist purge of the First Internationale. Leo was a participant in the 1871 Paris Uprising, which constituted a revolt against the French monarchy and also an important experience in self-organization for the growing workers' movement. The commune was drowned in the blood of up to 20,000 communards executed in its aftermath. A witness to how the repression was instituted in a more permanent form after the firing squads had finished their gruesome labors and was worked invisibly into the very fabric of society's political and economic forms, Leo theorized that the statist capitalist order constituted a constant war of the dominant classes against all of society. Insurrectionary anarchists like Alfredo Bonanno used social war as an expansion on class war to deploy an analysis of how all of society, even the organizations and ideas of the workers' movement, was structured to pacify and recuperate resistance and perpetuate the endless parade of alienation and commodification. Current understandings of social war incorporate an awareness of counterinsurgency, the scientific methodology of state planners to understand society as being in a permanent condition of resistance against established authority and the consequent need to eternally intervene to recuperate, institutionalize, or otherwise surveil and pacify rebellious populations to prevent their resistance from becoming more combative and insurrectionary. Counterinsurgency methodology was largely developed by colonizers in Kenya, Algeria, and Ireland, and quickly exported across the world to theaters of conflict like Los Angeles and Vietnam. In recent years, anarchist researcher Alexander Dunlap has used the lens of social war to describe state interventions in imposing and protecting extractivist infrastructure in colonized territories from Oaxaca to the Andes. We can place this conceptualization in dialogue with the model for the modern capitalist state proposed by systems theorists like Giovanni Arrighi. The marriage between a political military class focused on the domination of a space of places, territorial conquest in simplified terms, and a mercantile financial class focused on the domination of a space of flows the network of nodes and conduits in which production and trade take place. Combined or alternated, these two logics conquered populations, forced them to adopt capitalist relations, and repressed their resistance, establishing the conditions for accumulation, and oversaw the accumulation of wealth, in turn fueling and equipping the military machine that made their economic processes possible. This model parallels earlier theorizations by Mikhail Bakunin and Freddie Perlman. As we come back to the concept of social war throughout this book, we will see how it provides a necessary framework for understanding the nature of the crisis and realistic responses how it effectively complements the anti-colonial emphasis that is crucial to an honest inspection of ecocide, and also how it explains why the mainstream conversation is constrained in such a way to obscure what is actually going on. The insurrectionary text, 23 Theses Concerning Revolt, offers the following affirmation that helps us to untangle the crisis. Quote, single issue activism is capitalist alienation transposed on the realm of social struggles. End quote. 
When we understand that enclosure, the privatization, destruction, or sealing off of the commons, is simultaneously a military and economic activity designed to achieve social control as well as to accumulate wealth, we can imagine how enclosure might operate within the movements that seek to save the planet, stop climate change, and so forth. Single-issue activism on this front means focusing almost exclusively on greenhouse gas emissions, staying on message or not clouding the issue by intentionally avoiding any deep engagement with indigenous struggles, colonialism, capitalism, or social war. It means effectively enclosing the topic of climate change so that it does not enter into dialogue with a thousand other simultaneous interrelated conflicts and crises, thus preventing the emergence of a shared field of struggle in which we might put all our grievances, our hurt, and our needs in common, not with a logic of homogeneity or sameness, but precisely with an ecosystemic logic that recognizes the possibility for a mutually beneficial interrelation of differences. This distinction effectively draws the line between a technocratic capitalist response to the ecological crisis and a revolutionary anti-colonial one in which all changes are on the table. Everyone is a legitimate actor and no oppression need remain untouched or unchallenged. Vital to the conversation around the nature of the ecological crisis is the conversation around how we attempt to fix it. The technocratic pretension that climate is a distinct sphere of ecology, which in turn is separate from humanity and human social problems, is contradicted by one final connection I would like to trace the connection between the destruction of the earth and our own mental health. Questions of depression, anxiety, and withdrawal are typically excluded from mainstream discussion of the ecological crisis, but that is a fatal flaw to how society understands the crisis. Over half of child psychologists in the UK reported that their patients experienced anxiety due to ecological problems and the destruction of the environment. Meanwhile, suicide is up among children and teenagers in the US. Likewise, forced migration, which is increasingly being caused by ecological problems, is a major source of emotional suffering. On the other hand, living in relation with the natural world has proven benefits for people's mental health. I bring this up because I have seen what generalized depression does to social movements. When a cause looks hopeless, people tend towards one or another kind of avoidance. For some people, that means avoiding the question of the ecological crisis altogether. For other people, it means motivated reasoning leaps of logic that in other contexts would be transparent to them, but that in this case justify false solutions to the ecological crisis. These false solutions tend to constitute a sort of magic wand, a palliative that lets them believe some higher power will come in and fix the problem for us. To sum up, we cannot look at climate change alone because the emission of greenhouse gases is directly affected by innumerable other ecological processes, and the ability of the planet and its inhabitants to adapt to the warming, desertification, and sea level rise already underway depends on the health of ecosystems, the presence or absence of specific species, and the impacts of human economic practices, knowledge systems, and legal regimes. Following this thread, every aspect of the ecological crisis is caused by certain practices of human socioeconomic systems, 
each of which replaced other human socioeconomic practices as part of the global process of colonialism. Some of those suppressed practices constitute effective forms of ecological stewardship that harmonize the needs of the ecosystem and the needs of its human community for health, happiness, and freedom. Hoard the profit, share the blame. The Anthropocene reconsidered. The changes associated with the ecological crisis are so huge, many geologists favor naming a new epoch, beginning with the appearance of anthropogenic or human-caused changes to the planet, whether deforestation, carbon emissions, or nuclear radiation. This is a big deal. The geological epoch that still officially encompasses the present moment, the Holocene, has been going on for 11,650 years and without anthropogenic climate change would probably have lasted for a great deal more time. The epoch before it lasted for two and a half million years and the one before that lasted for three million years. The proposal for the name of the new epoch is the Anthropocene. The geological age defined by humans, Anthropos, even down to the rocks and the chemical processes of the planet. How fair, how accurate is it to blame these changes on humans? Though the society that is causing this major ecological crisis is truly global, it only became global through a particular course and not everyone has the same relationship to it. It might not be my society in the same way that it is your society. To understand why this is so, we need to take a little jaunt through the history of the ecological crisis and the society that has produced it. Homo sapiens diverged from another early hominin 300,000 years ago. However, human-related problems capable of destroying life systems on a planetary scale only began to emerge some 200 years ago. What's more, human social and technological evolution is nothing like a smooth linear progress from less to more ecocidal behaviors. The society that today reveals itself to be undeniably ecocidal is not some machine that was 300,000 years in the making. The vast majority of human history did not contribute to the present moment, and the idea that human technology is synonymous with ecocide is baseless and, on inspection, racist. It erases the vast majority of human experience, especially that which is external to Europe and its cultural offshoots. Because a planetary ecological crisis is unprecedented, we can try to find its roots in continental and regional scale ecological crises. In fact, such crises go back about 4,000 years or just over 1% of human history. And because the idea of a unilinear human history is such a pervasive myth, we should also be clear that ecocidal behaviors do not constitute the most recent 1% of human history. Rather, ecological crises were extremely rare three and 4,000 years ago, happening in just a tiny portion of humankind's overall territory. What kinds of human societies have caused the collapse of entire ecosystems? As it turns out, there is a clear pattern of major civilizations destroying their soil through deforestation and over-exploitation, and then experiencing some kind of political or population collapse. Sing C. Chu documents how throughout the history of Chinese civilization, economic expansions correlate 
with increases in catastrophic flooding. Both, in turn, are related to deforestation. Deforestation dramatically decreases the absorption of rainfall, leading to flooding, and economic expansion in a, an accumulative statist society means the construction of massive palaces, temples, and navies. The clearing of complex forest gardens for denuded monocrop fields and robust fuel consumption, not just for human needs, but for export economies based on metal, brick, and ceramic production. Deforestation can also spell the disappearance of resources on which a city depends. As when the capital of the Japanese state, Heian, was largely abandoned in the 12th century CE after the surrounding forests were all cut down. A multifaceted ecological crisis was perhaps the major cause of the decline of the city-states of classical Greece. Deforestation, loss of soil fertility, water and air pollution, the local extinction of species like the lion and leopard, localized climate change towards greater aridity and higher temperatures, the subsequent spread of tropical diseases like malaria, all were caused by the state building and economic accumulation of the Greek city-states. Cities like Athens built commercial empires through colonial outposts from the Black Sea to Iberia. Through trade or war and enslavement, they made local populations dependent on manufactured goods produced in the center and in turn had them send back metals, grain, timber, hides, wool, meat, perfumes, and enslaved humans. Athens and the other metropolises were dependent on the colonies for most of their food needs, especially as deforestation in Attica, Macedonia, and Peloponnesus sharply decreased domestic agricultural productivity. They also had to feed an inflated workforce of artisans and slaves, such as the 11,000 laborers who toiled in the 87 miles of tunnels of the Laurium silver mines to dig up a metal of no biological utility. All that accumulation attracted the greed of neighboring states and sparked internecine disputes for dominance. Athens practiced genocide against cities that defied it, but their heavy-handedness only provoked more resistance. Attica was definitively deforested to build the warships that would defeat the Persians, 449 BCE, and that would sink to the bottom of the Aegean and Ionian seas in the Peloponnesian War, 431 to 404 BCE. In that same century, Athens would have to export its metallurgy industry to be closer to remaining wood sources. Attica lost about half its population between 431 and 313 BCE. The silting of harbors from erosion triggered by deforestation was so extreme that multiple port cities lost their access to the sea. The coastline moved out and coastal cities like Prien, Myas, and Ephesus became inland cities. There is also evidence that deforestation contributed to the collapse of the Roman Empire, something the government itself recognized when the empire started taking measures, too little too late, to preserve their forests. All these examples concern ancient states States are relatively rare in human history, and only in the last few hundred years have they come to dominate the entire globe. But one thing it seems all states do is destroy their environment. States need to be able to rule a subject population and exploit wealth from them. This leads them to impose monocrop field agriculture. Monocrop fields are easy to tax because they all become ripe at the same time. The amount of tax due is easy to calculate on the basis of simple geometry. 
much of which was developed for exactly this purpose. And the subject population cannot simply run away from state territory. A primary response of people to state authority right up until states became universal because their food security is tied to fields that can easily be found and destroyed. On the contrary, stateless populations that have to exist in defiance of state authority tend to rely on diverse practices of food autonomy, favoring a mix of hunting, gathering, forest gardens, and root crops that are easy to hide, easy to disperse through a non-flattened illegible stateless landscape and that can be harvested when most convenient for the harvester. Incidentally, and in a clear confirmation of the usefulness of the concept of social war, state-resistant food practices encourage people to exist sustainably as a part of a robust ecosystem, reject authoritarian forms of organization, and facilitate defensive guerrilla warfare. Whereas statist practices of monocrop agriculture make it easier to surveil, extort, and control subject populations, destroy biodiversity, and they eventually lead to ecological crisis. There are also plenty of examples of states passing laws to protect portions of their environment, though, quote, States will act to prevent environmental degradation only when their economic interests are shown to be directly threatened, close quote. And I would add, when their social control or national security are threatened. This has several implications. Often, because of the nature of tipping points, states tend to take action too late. Furthermore, the purpose of state conservation is never to restore ecological health or even to protect the survival and quality of life of its subject populations. It is to preserve its wealth and power. This is one of the origins of the very concept of conservation, roping off an area of designated natural resources to protect it from human usage. Though at the same time, to preserve it for other usages the state deems strategic. Conservation, therefore, tends to be a, an act of enclosure, an attack on the very practices of commoning that actually make it possible for humans to respectfully take part in an ecosystem. The French state provides a good example with the creation of the artificial lands forest throughout the 19th century draining off extensive wetlands that supported a largely autonomous pastoral population in favor of pine plantations to benefit the timber and turpentine industries. There are other grave implications to the logic of state-driven conservation. Since the objective is strategic, state cons conservationism is accompanied by ecological imperialism the game is about protecting your domestic resources while destroying or occupying the resources of your neighbor. The British Navy, which was the primary vehicle for Britain's massive colonial empire, ensured a supply of large trees needed for ship construction by expropriating communal forests and excluding peasants from the forest ecosystem they had long relied on on pain of death. The government even began applying the death penalty to anyone who obscured their face with charcoal, a practice peasants had taken so as to be able to gather firewood or hunt in anonymity. Bestseller Jared Diamond has told a story about forest conservation during Japan's Edo period that has become something of a parable for many environmentalists desperate to believe that the right government can flick a switch and begin protecting natural resources as a sheer act of will or mere policy divorced from any other considerations. What actually happened is more complex. 
Statist militarism and warfare were major drivers of deforestation in 16th century Japan. After a bloody series of wars to establish centralized control, the Tokugawa shogunate tried to preserve state power and prevent collapse by encouraging feudal relations between classes. The military slash political class had rights of exploitation, but subject to clear limits, and the laboring class had a high degree of economic autonomy as compared both to imperial slave economies and liberal modernity. The shogunate passed laws preserving the mountainous areas as forest land, in part hunting reserves for the elite, and in part village commons. But it was local village councils and not the government that carried out the actual practices that restored the decimated forests. In other words, the state undertook these measures to provide a social release valve and avoid the combined threats of social collapse and economic collapse. They did not have the capacity to carry out their dictates or manage reforestation. It was largely left to common people to do this. The feudal compromise allowed the Japanese state to survive. And the next chapter in the story illustrates why it is not a good idea to entrust states with power over the environment. Because state policy reflects the state's interests, not our own. With the Meiji Restoration, state power centralized rapidly and industrialization proceeded in leaps and bounds as the fledgling empire sought to compete with neighboring states and intruding Euro-American powers, militaristic competition being an inherent problem where states are concerned. The Meiji government legislated forest protection but these protections were on paper only, another recurring theme when it comes to state-led conservationism. And the bountiful forests of the Edo period were quickly cut down for railroads, building construction, and factories. In tandem, the Japanese state began an aggressive drive towards resource imperialism, conquering Taiwan, Korea, Manchuria, and other territories, and setting itself on a path to carry out some of the major genocides of the 20th century. In the post-war period, Japan was able to replenish its depleted forests around the time its emerging high-tech economy favored the importation of cheap forestry products from poorer neighbors that could not afford the luxury of ecological protections in the new neoliberal economy. The Japanese market has been one of the major drivers of deforestation in the tropical forests of Malaysia and Indonesia. While it seems that all states are ecocidal, not all societies that damage their environment are states. However, social hierarchies still play a role. The Rapa Nui society, called Easter Island by colonizers, experienced a population collapse when their soil failed due to deforestation around 1600. Rapa Nui oral history speaks of a more centralized hierarchical political system before the decline. Carving and transportation of the Moai, stone statues that elevated the elite status of clan leaders, required extensive scaffolding and especially rolling logs, and was one cause of deforestation together with extensive agriculture. Deforestation was so extreme that several tree and other species went extinct and the topsoil eroded, leading to severe food shortages. I should point out that several white writers have likely exaggerated the extent of the collapse and spun lurid tales of cannibalism despite a scarcity of evidence of increased interpersonal violence. It is telling that white writers tend to place all the emphasis on the population decline that occurred before European colonization of Rapa Nui 
and not on the collapse caused by violent colonizers. The former resulted in a population decline by a factor of about five. The latter, European colonization, resulted in a population decline by a factor of over 20. States tend to lock people into fixed ways of living in demarcated territories, even if those ways of living are unsustainable, in order to hold on to power. Stateless societies are more able to change their ways. Of the three earliest civilizations, societies based on irrigated field agriculture and at least some prevalence of city construction, one of them, the Indus Valley or Harappan civilization, appears to have been stateless and certainly exhibits far fewer archaeological indicators of statism than the Nile Valley and Mesopotamian civilizations, such as monuments to rulers or supreme deities, wealth inequality, food poverty among the lower classes, and a militarized architecture or other signs of permanent warfare. If they had a ruling class, the rulers left no sign of their passing in stark distinction to all known ancient states. Rather than entering into a cycle of imperial expansion and eventual collapse like the other two, the Harappan civilization was the only one to walk away when ecological conditions no longer favored large field agriculture and dense urban living. In this case, the crisis was probably not one of their own making, also a relevant distinction, but a natural interruption of the monsoon cycle and a decrease in precipitation. In response, Harappan society migrated upland to a territory that still had sufficient natural irrigation and shifted to a more decentralized, small-scale settlement pattern. This response is especially relevant when we compare it to Mesopotamia, which existed as part of the same world system as the Indus Valley cities, enmeshed in intense networks of trade. Deforestation linked to economic expansion in Mesopotamia caused increased flooding, the silting up of irrigation channels, and the salinization of fields, making it increasingly difficult to grow crops. In the Indus Valley, rainfall decreased around 2200 BCE, by which time the Harappan cities had already begun a slow decline and after which they changed their settlement patterns more rapidly. This suggests that they began to give up on their more exploitative, labor-intensive lifestyle as soon as the ecology became unfavorable, perhaps even starting this transformation before the climatic shift. Yet the decrease in precipitation in Mesopotamia began earlier, with important droughts throughout the 4th millennium BCE and again around 2200 BCE. Yet the advanced bureaucratic state took no notice and forced its subjects to carry on with business as usual. The ecological crisis eventually became unavoidable. In the early dynastic period, 3000 to 2350 BCE, crop yields stood at 2030 liters of grain per hectare. By 1700 BCE, this had dropped to 718 liters per hectare. But rather than read the writing on the wall, elites simply forced lower classes to work harder in squeezing every last drop of blood out of the stony earth, such that cultivators began seeding more intensively and skipping the vital fallow years, leading to further degradation of the soil. The state mandated surplus production, captured entire populations, and put them to work in towns focused on large-scale textile production to keep their economy humming. It was a lost cause. The cities of southern Mesopotamia faded away, and power shifted to the north with the rise of Babylon. But Babylon had learned nothing, and its days were also numbered. 
much of the region of what was once lush forest and fertile gardens is still a desert today. There may have been processes of adaptation and abandonment similar to the Harappan experience in the Mississippian, Maya, and Tiwanaku civilizations of the Americas. Around 1000 CE, a large civilization arose along the Mississippi River based on the cultivation of maize. They built large earthen pyramids that played a role in a more centralized hierarchical spiritual system. Perhaps in response to the declining quality of life among the incipient lower classes due to state effects like increasing warfare and stratification, deforestation and biodiversity loss, possibly compounded by climatic changes, the civilization was abandoned around 1400 to 1500 CE, and the population diffused to live in a more decentralized manner, selecting which of their society's technologies, from maize cultivation to mound building, to preserve and readapt on a smaller scale. The Maya civilization erected huge cities and great monuments across the Yucatan Peninsula and beyond. Millions of Mayan people still live in the same region today, though Western journalists, historians, and educators tend to speak about a disappearance or a lost people. This Indiana Jones-style trope combines the racist erasure of the other with the tendency of statists to view stateless periods of history as dark ages. Amid all the scholarly articles on the, quote, classical Maya collapse, close quote, of 800 to 900 CE, it is difficult to find any that take into account oral histories passed on by Mayan peoples today. What occurred was not a disappearance. No one vanished. Rather, they changed where and how they lived. Most notably, over vast areas, they stopped building cities and high-status monuments and no longer submitted to the political authority of theocratic rulers. Significantly, quote, regions that were less integrated and hierarchically organized in the classic period experienced less dramatic collapse, close quote. The causes included a long drought caused largely by deforestation and exacerbated by soil depletion from large-scale agriculture, and increasingly lethal warfare as different monarchies struggled for dominance. Biodiversity loss was also a factor as deforestation led to the collapse of many animal populations, the disappearance of opportunities for hunting, a less diverse diet with less protein, and thus greater susceptibility to famine. Some kind of popular rebellion also played a role, whether a massive refusal or an all-out revolution, as people abandoned or toppled the ruling elite, and in at least some areas refused to maintain centralizing spiritual, political, and agricultural practices instead favoring more decentralized, egalitarian ecological practices, or in the words of one study, quote, less tolerance for hierarchy and centralization, close quote, paired with a, quote, collective ethos, close quote, and an ability to organize collective works. This was more an adaptation than a collapse as they preserved much of their spirituality, arts, and knowledge systems up to and beyond the Spanish invasion. The social mobility that allowed them to survive the havoc wreaked by their governors also allowed some of them to escape Spanish domination for nearly two centuries by moving to the geographies most illegible to European colonization. The Tiwanaku civilization in the Andes existed from about 550 to 1000 CE, erecting stone cities dominated by great temples. It was a theocratic system 
in which a diversity of gods and spirits were unified under the central authority of the sun god, access to whom was controlled by a professionalized caste of priests. Andean oral history speaks of a primarily spiritual rebellion against Tiwanaku's centralization and an abandonment of the civilization that left the region stateless for several centuries. In a contrasting example, social elites may take advantage of ecological crises they cause in order to augment their power. It seems possible that in both ancient Egypt and Hawaii before colonization, an ecological disaster created a population of environmental refugees who could be exploited in ways that popular social values previously would not have allowed, granting elites access to a subject population and a dependent labor force necessary for accumulating wealth and power. We have found one piece of the puzzle. Humans do not destroy the environment, but states do. Stateless societies are by no means perfect but they are less likely to carry out ecocide and more able to adapt and change their ways. Entrenched hierarchies inside and outside states often encourage ecocidal behaviors and prevent adaptation. Throughout human history, revolution has been a common sense and effective response to the ecocide conducted by ruling classes. If we do not revolt in the face of ecocide, the likely result is that states will increase their power and intensify their exploitative practices. The regional ecological collapses we have just looked at present a clear precedent to the kind of ecocide we are faced with today, but we must find another cause for two important changes the extreme quantitative shift from regional disasters to a global disaster, and a qualitative shift from cyclical histories of centralization and rebellion to a linear history of exponential growth in which all territories are locked into an insatiable process of accumulation and ecocide. Industrialism is an obvious candidate but I would argue that placing the blame on a society of smokestacks and fossil fuels is to confuse cause with effect. Massive deforestation in North America was already well underway before the widespread deployment of steam power and the advent of industrialism. Early settlers, scientists, and politicians, from Christopher Columbus to Thomas Jefferson, advocated deliberate deforestation to, quote, improve the climate. Meanwhile, 16th century deforestation in Britain fueled the immigration of poor settlers to the colonies. Industrialism was the consequence of the exponential expansion of capitalism. The engine for that expansion was colonialism. In order to take off, Industrialism needed access to liquid capital for large-scale investments, it needed captive markets, and it needed the reliable availability of cheap resources like sugar, cotton, and animal skins. These were the products of colonialism, from the Spanish silver mines of Potosi that used indigenous slave labor, to the Spanish, French, and English sugar plantations of the Caribbean and the cotton plantations of the North American mainland, all of which relied on the mass enslavement of Africans, to the French fur trapping empire farther north, to the cycle of accumulation engineered by the Dutch in Southeast Asia. The cause of the global ecological crisis is colonialism. It is no coincidence that the political, economic, and cultural institutions that were developed by the most successful Northern European colonizers are the ones that are now global. These institutions, from stock exchanges and corporations to universities, land privatization, political parties, 
and property-based legal systems were spread throughout a world system that was created by wars of conquest and acts of genocide, with all other ways of life being brutally stamped out. The British, whose empire came to cover 25% of the planet's land area, used an effective combination of tactics. They conquered footholds in territories they wished to colonize, decimated local populations in vicious acts of warfare, gave defeated societies the chance to become British allies, sold them European weapons to serve as effective proxies for the capture of slaves and territory, imported enslaved people from other areas to jumpstart a plantation economy and destroy any practices of commoning, and further integrated colonized peoples with missionaries and with treaties that offered the hope of survival adapting to European ways in order to be recognized as human by European overseers, even as treaty guaranteed rights were progressively whittled away and forgotten. Other colonizers, from major players like the Dutch to relatively minor players like the Swedish, used similar methods. The kind of economic growth that accompanied colonialism was extractivist and genocidal. From the islands of the Taino to the Andean highlands, Spanish colonizers forced indigenous peoples to mine gold and silver, cutting off their hands if they did not meet their quotas. Belgium applied similar tactics in Central Africa when part of the population of the Maluku Islands refused to continue supplying spices for the Dutch, the Dutch massacred them and imported an enslaved population from other islands, building a new society from the ground up, designed for maximum productivity and discipline. When the Dutch, Portuguese, British, and others could not conquer China outright, they conquered trading posts and began to organize large-scale opium production in South Asia, importing the addictive commodity in order to jumpstart a capitalist economy. Over 12 million people were kidnapped in Africa and enslaved, sent to work in sugar and cotton plantations in the Americas. One to two and a half million died in the terrible conditions of the transatlantic voyage and many millions more died from the wars encouraged by European slave traders in order to get their captives. Europeans also began a profitable commerce that continues in Africa to this day with murderous results, the international arms trade. Cotton went to supply the looms of the first industrial proletariat on the planet, many of them child laborers. Marshlands were drained and forests were cut down for fuel, for the building of ships and for the establishment of plantations. The machine kept accelerating, next it turned to coal as a fuel source, and the destabilization of the planet's climate, already begun thanks to deforestation, was now fully underway. The society responsible for colonialism and for capitalism would throw anything and anyone into its furnaces, whatever the consequences. Such were the origins of the global economic system we have today. Resources extracted by the most ruthless means available, rationalizing the pillaging of living ecosystems and the crushing of human spirits and aspirations so that everyone and everything that does not belong to the owning and governing classes is squeezed for profit or left to rot in surveilled sacrifice zones. Natural wealth shipped across the globe to be transformed by machines and workers treated like machines, turned into commodities and sold for a profit that goes not to the ones who did the work, but to the ones who were given the privilege of organizing these circuits of exploitation. Profits reinvested in similar exploitative ventures or in fatuous gambling on the likelihood of such ventures to turn a profit 
on future prices and currency values, anything that satisfies the fundamental imperative of capital to accumulate more capital, growth by any means necessary. Never before in human history had capitalist logics been hegemonic in human life and the life of the planet. With a new model of the state effectively fused with capitalist accumulation, conquering the globe and effectively criminalizing and destroying the commons everywhere, forcing the entire human species out of its myriad ecological niches and into a suicidal dependence on a growth-based economy. Official decolonization after World War II did little to change this dynamic. Because it had to occur according to the colonizer's timeline and criteria, governed by coups, fresh invasions, debt bondage, and structural adjustment, it is more accurate to speak of neo-colonialism than of any substantive end to colonization. The shift to new forms of colonialism only strengthened the implantation of Western institutions. If colonialism created the possibility for a global ecological crisis, the crisis is currently accelerating not through inertia, but because the same global system in updated form has intensified. More powerful than ever, the stockholders and governors of this system not only hoard the wealth, they are uniquely responsible for the devastation caused by an extractive economy. The wealthiest 1% is responsible for double the CO2 emissions of the poorer half of the global population. While some humans are profiting immensely off the destruction of the planet and doing everything they can to prevent meaningful change, other humans are doing everything they can to protect the land and preserve healthy relationships between humans and the rest of the ecosystem. Consider that 80% of biodiversity on the planet is to be found on indigenous territory. Saying that humans are responsible for ecological devastation is a continuation of colonial racism and it is an insult to the peoples who have fought against obliteration to preserve their way of life and their relationship with their territory. It is also an insult to the many people who despite growing up in a culture totally infused with the values of capitalism, have risked their lives and freedom to defend the land and halt destructive development projects. And it is an insult to the hundreds of millions who are subjected to extreme poverty or absolute precarity by the very same economic order that profits from ecocide, who have to worry about their personal survival and that of their family and community and do not have the luxury of choosing between different job opportunities and consumer products based on how ecological they might be. As Catherine Youssef argues in A Billion Black Anthropocenes, the framework of the Anthropocene is racist, and it also serves to obscure our view to hide the actual system at the heart of the problem. People in the Global South, people dehumanized by Western slavery, colonialism, and racism, finally get included in the category human just in time to share the blame for the devastation caused by a social system that has ravaged them far more than they have profited from it. The ecological crisis is not only the greatest crisis we face, it also encompasses nearly every other crisis and conflict, including the economic crisis that subjects billions of people to precarity or crushing poverty, the crisis of legitimacy that is plaguing governments worldwide and the technological crisis that juggles problems of totalitarianism, surveillance, and mass unemployment. End of chapter one. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.